Pixar don't really make bad movies. They have this habit of everything they do being pretty fantastic. So when they came to you with the idea of a sequel, was it, I mean, I'm sure it usually when, when it comes to doing kind of follow on movies, there's always that kind of apprehension to begin with. But when it comes to Disney Pixar, did you just sort of go, I trust you guys, I'm going to sign on. It's almost irrespective of, of, of the screenplay. Totally. I, I, I feel that way about Pixar and I definitely feel that way about, about Brad Bird. I mean, he, he did Iron Giant, he did Ratatouille, Incredibles. Uh, so I, I, I implicitly trusted him. And you must have been particularly thrilled when learning this is really Elastigirl's movie, isn't it? I mean, it, it sort of starts and you sort of starts to take shape, and you realise this is really her film. I think you know, not, you know, I, I, the the brilliance of of the movie of 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 Brad is that every single character is so beautiful, so fully formed, so complicated, and filled of with opposites and contradictions, and I, I you know. And I think that Mr. Incredible is so, so funny, you know, and Craig T. Nelson is just hysterical in the part. Um, so I don't know, when Violet is going through her whole thing and Dash is, is reminds me of like some 12 year old boys that I happen to know, which happen to be my sons. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very identifiable movie. So I'm gonna begin by asking about how this comes into fruition. I mean, did you decide, right, I'm, let's make another Incredibles movie and then try and find a story? No. Or does the story come first and then you think, right, let's turn this in, into Well, a I mean, my head is sort of like a giant uh, airplane hanger where there's a lot of, <laughs> different ideas kind of being worked on in different corners. And I, I kind of shuffle around between the various assemblages. And uh, the idea for this film I had when we were doing this, uh, which is promoting the first film, which is what if the assignment went to Bob? What if somebody gave an assignment to return to superherodom, but it was Bob, a, Hel Hel Helen, that got it instead of Bob. Mm -hmm. And uh, how would Bob take that? Well, he wouldn't take it well. And that, you know, um, but he would, if it's his wife that gets the job, he has to be supportive. So that's automatically a great bunch of things for an actor to do. And, and, and in this case, the actors are animators, as well as the vocal performer. And at the same time, there was a side of Helen that was shown in the beginning of the first film where she's like not thinking of family at all. She's a totally professional woman and that's the way she sees herself. And so it was also interesting to bring that side of her out. Uh, um, plus, there was uh, the, um, the fact that the audience knew that Jack-Jack had multiple powers, but the pars did not. And then I knew that that would be a part of it. So those elements I had early on, but the other part of the story that I needed was the superhero villain story. And that took me forever to get right. And I mean, what, your, your son, I mean, it must be so great to, to make a movie that your sons can watch. And is it, do they, is it quite weird for them knowing that you're Elastic Girl? Because I guess this must be a movie that, it's the first Incredibles and now obviously Incredibles 2, it appeals to people of that generation so remarkably. I mean, what's it like for, to them to have a mum in that world? Well, I, I, I can certainly say that it's one of the things that's been amazing about this movie and kind of a revelation is that I have, I, I know all these people who saw The Incredibles when they were like four, five, six, seven, eight. And now they're seeing this movie when they're in their 20s. And they so love it. I mean, in a way, they are the most enthusiastic audience that I've encountered so far are people who are like between the ages of 20 and 25. They, they, they're ravenous for the movie. Yeah, yeah am I right in thinking that the supervillain changed across the course of the making of this movie? Oh, yes. yes. And yeah. by the way, on the first movie too, I yeah. came up to Pixar, I had uh, developed the film myself, I had designs, I had a story, I had a style, uh, paintings and all that stuff, and, uh, but I had a different villain. And we got into production and we tried an alternate opening where I introduced a new villain and killed him off in the opening sequence. And that was Syndrome. And everyone, including myself, liked Syndrome better than the villain that we had. So he was the, a late addition to the story of the first movie. And uh, similarly on this film, uh, the Screenslaver was a late addition to this story. 
Yeah, it needed to support the family arc, which is the first thing that landed, and it was the first thing that we were making, and that once that was sort of working, you wanted to come up with a villain that supported what was going on with Helen. And I had a villain uh, that got the movie going, but what got the movie going and greenlit and a release date was not what we ended up with, because it uh, five months later, it was not... It was too com cumbersome and complicated and wasn't helping the other part of the story. But what do you think it is then about this particular world, this particular family that has that appeal? Because I mean, so many people of a certain age, if you say, what's your favorite Pixar movie? They will cite The Incredibles as being their favorite. I think they recognize the family. I think they, the, the, the dynamic of the family just feels so familiar to them. They're, they're fighting. They disagree, they argue, they're competitive. I mean, Mr. Incredible doesn't like that Elastigirl has this job. He feels, you know, really threatened by it. And that's very disarming to have that kind of humanness expressed. No, I really enjoyed the fact that, was, that you had Jonathan Banks and Bob Odenkirk in there. And obviously, they're my two favorite characters. <laughs> Does that yeah. indicate that I'm a Breaking Bad slash Better Call Saul fan? I was going to ask, was that, did you go, right, let's go and get the two best characters from Breaking Bad, or did they just happen to just go through the normal auditioning process? Well, they were perfect for the characters, um, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, Jonathan Banks, who did uh, Rick Dicker, um, was the guy, the, the wonderful uh, guy who did the original voice of Rick Dicker had uh, some health issues and, had, and has since died. And so we couldn't use him and I tried to find a sound alike and nobody sounded like him. So instead, when we exhausted that, we thought, well, if we were casting this character from scratch, who would be a really good Rick Dicker? And we thought of Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan is, is wonderful, but it's a slightly different take on Rick Dicker. So <laughs> John a likes to A little darker. Say, you, you, you would never believe that Bud Lucky is the original Rick Dicker. He was a pretty solid guy, but jo Jonathan's Rick Dicker, he might have killed a man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but he's a sure. legit <laughs> Rick Dicker. That's in the deleted scenes on and, the DVD. And Bob Odenkirk, I, I just yeah. am a huge fan of, and he was the first one that I wanted for the character of Winston Dever, and we're lucky that we got him. And I was wondering, so, I mean, the animation of, the animating sort of human beings has progressed so much in the last 15 years. I was wondering about the process here in uh, utilizing new technology and at the same time maintaining that same familiar aesthetic that we all right. recognize from the first well, movie. Well, the quick, quickest way to discuss it is this film looks how exactly how we wanted the first movie to look and our technology and our experience level wasn't quite up to. I'm very proud of the first movie and what we were able to do, mm -hmm. but we were on the absolute bleeding edge of the, the technology at that point, and we were about ready to crash and burn at every moment. Um, and on this film, not only was our crew far more experienced, but our technology was, was way more advanced. Yeah. The design, I mean, the design aesthetic is similar, but... We you, went back to the original yeah. sculpt. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But the ability to sculpt and articulate the characters has advanced dramatically, and it allows us to get what we want faster. Yeah, and everything had to be rebuilt, because that first movie is on an eight-track tape, essentially, and <laughs> it's, like, not not usable. And do you think, do you think it can be a, a challenge when, when you know what it is about a film that audiences love? When you then go back and do a sequel, it must be very hard to balance, because you, you want to give them more of what they want, but at the same time, sometimes no what it is that people like can make it harder to then achieve in some ways because I guess it's being kind of blissfully unaware of what's going to be successful is what can make a movie kind of shine. Well I think you know you you totally articulated what's challenging about doing a, 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 a sequel and, and I think that you have there have to be something about the movie that feels very familiar that audiences love and then you know this was I think the dilemma that Brad Bird faced when he decided to make Incredibles 2. Just really, really quickly, this is Pixar's 20th film. I was wondering, outside the Incredibles franchise, what's your favorite ever Pixar movie, if you're allowed to say? Um, I consider, it, there are three movies that are connected, which are the Toy Story movies. Are, are I think that's a darn near perfect trilogy and one of the best that, that, that has ever been done in movies. I have to say I love all the films I didn't work on. So that's about 13 of the seven. Uh, I worked on seven and the other 13 I love. I really do love all the other films. Yeah, the Toy Story ones for me. I mean, there's something about those films that has Pixar's DNA in them in, in ways that no, no other In films the purest are. sense, sense yeah, yeah. yeah. I love Finding Nemo. I thought that was, you know, a fabulous movie. But I have to say, probably for me, outside of Incredibles, I love Toy Story. I love that... that uh, that, that 
the, all three films. I, I just think they're amazing, and I can't wait for Toy Story 4. Because I think Toy Story is, at the moment, the best ever trilogy, probably of all time, and I include The Godfather in that. But do you think The Incredibles could, could, could have a third movie? Has there been any discussion yet, or is it, is it something that you reckon could happen maybe, maybe further down the line if it was to? I would certainly never say never, uh, but there are no discussions at this moment. But I'm just unbelievably thrilled to, to be here with this movie. Yeah. It must be just a great character just to step back into the, into the head of and just to, to, to bring back to life. Yeah, it was kind of like coming home. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!